and so our next speaker is also uh, uh, one of my colleagues here at Western and the Rotman Institute. So uh, Mike Anderson is going to be talking to us about neural reuse and the in-principle limitations on reproducibility in the positive neural type. So let's join, uh, please join me in welcoming. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. And um, thanks also to you know, the organizers and, and all the speakers so far, this is a, a really nice event and a really nice space. Organizer. Not really. I'm just a figurehead. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to warn you in advance. Maybe it's not needed, but this is going to be sort of data-heavy and theory-poor. Because uh, what I want to do is, is just show you a, a series of findings uh, about um, uh, the functional architecture of the brain. And then use that as kind of an example of a kind of system that makes reproducibility a kind of a difficult task. And not just difficult, um, but that failures of reproducibility of various kinds that I think uh, might push one to, to enact a different kind of science for systems like the brain. That's the kind of simple claim. But as I say, I'm going to mostly show you all the data, and then we can kind of think together about how we should deal with the kind of complexity that uh, I'll be uh, showcasing. So I had this organized around what I call basic brain facts. They're, they're really going to uh, focus on three. One is the functional complexity of the parts of the brain. Uh, the second is the dynamics of the brain. And the third is the plasticity of the brain. Um, and I'll, I'll give you examples as we go. So the, the brain is functionally complex in at least the following way, which is that the mapping between uh, neural structure and cognitive function is typically many to many. Right. Any interesting cognitive function uses multiple brain regions. And uh, every brain region, not every, but nearly every brain region is involved in multiple <coughs> cognitive functions. Right. So this is a, it's not typically the kind of one-to-one -one selectivity that has been the guiding standard of the cognitive neurosciences for some 50 years uh, and, and continues to stubbornly persist in certain institutions, uh, MIT. Um, <coughs> Uh, so selectivity, right? So that's, as I say, and the, the primary guiding idealization uh, 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 for the functional organization of the brain for at least 50 years. And the notion is quite simple um, and intuitive, right? The idea would be that brain regions selectively respond to specific input classes and particular kinds of tasks or task categories. So here's you know, a, a famous example, uh, Penfield's motor and sensory homunculus. Um, this is roughly true uh, of, the, of the sensory uh, uh, regions of the brain, roughly. It's really not true at all for the motor regions of the brain. Uh, and it doesn't take much thought to see why. If you understand motor control at all, the idea that there'd be a one-to-one -one mapping from muscle groups to parts of the brain for control is silly, right? Uh, try lifting your foot up without shifting your posture. And now think about all the coordination that had to happen to make that simple action possible. Um, uh, and so, and in fact, anatomically, this is not true. There's a, a fun a sort of history here about why they got this so wrong. Um, having to do with mixing up signal and noise. Uh, I won't tell that story, but, it, uh, but I like telling it. So if you want to hear about it, catch me in the break. Uh, and here's, you know, a, again, a different version of kind of domain selectivity, right? And this is a, a picture of the classic notion that vision is located, located back here and, and, uh, and um, you know, language is over here and executive function is here, right? Um, so this is, you know, and of course you've seen these maps. These maps still get reproduced in uh, psychology and neuroscience textbooks. I wish they would stop, and I'll show you why. So one way we can investigate this claim about how selective brain regions are is to do a functional diversity analysis. It's a simple sort of three-step process. First, you build a large collection, and my collection has currently over 6,000 experiments of brain imaging data. And when I say build, I say get your students to build. Um, uh, step two is you categorize cognitive processes, um, you know, emotion, visual perception, auditory perception, or whatever schema you think is reasonable. And uh, uh, my colleagues and I have done this with various classification schemes. Um, and then you calculate the diversity of function observed in each part of the brain. How do you do that? Well, um, what we did is we borrowed a, a measure from uh, uh, ecology, sham entropy, uh, and then blah, 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 some mathematical details that I won't go over. Um, but the, the, the idea here is quite simple, right? So uh, if you're interested in the diversity of an ecosystem, Right? You say, ah, well, if you have a particular part of the ecosystem in which there are many plants and animals from many diverse species, that's a high diversity uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, in contrast, if most plants and animals uh, um, come from a single or just a few species in a particular area, that's a low diversity area. Right? So by analogy, we say, 
look, if you take a part of the brain, a, a piece of the brain, and there are many cognitive functions from many different categories, that's a high diversity area. And if most co cognitive functions come from a single, only a few categories, that would be a low diversity area. Right? Straightforward uh, analogy here. Now, these pictures will come up uh, several times in this uh, presentation, so let me orient you to them here. Uh, the, the classic notion of how the brain is organized is, uh, is that it's modular in the sense that it has parts that are dedicated to particular functions um, uh, and, uh, and that those functions interact with one another to, to give rise to cognitive functions. So that picture of modularity, so we can imagine here a really simple brain with only six regions defined however you feel like defining regions, it doesn't matter, this is abstract. Um, and you can imagine that uh, so suppose we have a, 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 a sensory function and a motor function, right? So areas one, two, and three there are de devoted to that sensory function, right? That's kind of what they do. It's, that's you know, your vision module or something like this. Um, and areas two, uh, four, five, and six uh, are dedica dedicated to motor control, let's say. Okay, that's your, 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 your motor module. Now, they have to overlap somewhat because they have to communicate. Right? And that's illustrated here by the fact that the two things share uh, region two. Right? So you get a visual uh, input uh, uh, through your vision module. It communicates that to your motor system, which then does something about what, it, what's, what the animal has seen. So that would be a classic modular organization. Uh, I'm going to talk more about neural reuse, which is one of the things I've been harping about for at least 10 years now. Uh, but this is, this is uh, the idea that instead of a modular organization, instead Parts of the brain are used and reused uh, across different um, uh, uh, across different cognitive domains and cognitive functions, but that they cooperate in different patterns under each condition, right? And you can sort of this is just illustrated there again schematically, right? So uh, you know a lot of the brain is involved in both the visual uh, control and the motor control system, but the patterns of cooperation between them differ under those two conditions. Okay. Now you can sort of read off diversity expectations um, uh, just from the, this schematic. Right? If you've got a modular brain, you'd expect most regions of the brain to be near the bottom of the scale, because right? they're dedicated to whatever uh, you know, a modular process they're, uh, by hypothesis, dedicated to. Uh, in contrast, if, it, if your brain, parts of your brain are used and reused uh, across multiple circumstances, you'd expect the measurement to be closer to, to, to one, higher diversity areas. Okay? And here I apologize to, to scientists in the room and even to most of the philosophers, but I've been before audiences recently uh, who didn't even know what a correlation was. Um, and you're not going to understand any of this talk if you're at that sort of level. Um, and so here I'm going to tell you how to read a histogram. Right? Most of you know this, but there may be people who don't, and so you're welcome. Um, so a histogram is a simple way of representing data uh, when you're taking multiple measurements of something. Right, so as I say, on the, on the y-axis here, we have the number of measurements, and uh, on the x-axis, the, the value measure. So suppose it's height, and we're just measuring people in this room. Right? And so I measure the first person, and they turn out they're fairly short. Um, and I measure somebody else, and oh, that's sort of maybe a, a medium height person, another sort of on the short end. Right? And I just keep doing this, person to person to person. Right? And every time I get a measurement, I put it on my graph here. Right? And oh, there's a tall person. That was Chris. Um, and eventually, you, right, you finish your measurements, and you get a distribution of your data. Right? There's a shape to this data. And the shape can tell you something, uh, can tell you interesting things about the nature of the underlying variable you're measuring, or the system that you're taking measurements of. So here uh, is um, the 2010 SAT scores uh, from the United States. Right? This is the scholastic aptitude test you have to take to get into college in the States. Um, this is a nice normal distribution, and it's normal distribution because they're designed that way. But this would tell you something about um, the performance of the population uh, on this test, right? Most people are, are performing, you know, in this middle region, and there are some people who are really good at it and some people who are really poor at it. That's what this shows you. Uh, similar normal distribution is if you ask uh, a whole bunch of people how much money is in Brad Pitt's wallet, uh, you interestingly get a normal distribution centered around $500. Uh, I, I, the real answer is clearly zero, because he has people. Um, he doesn't carry his own money. <laughs> but not, and nobody said zero, interestingly enough, right? Anyway, so another nice normal distribution. Um, uh, here's a, a somewhat different one with a, with a, a, a significant skew. Right? So this is uh, US household income. 
uh, I think the Canadian one looks, I couldn't get, I look at Stats Canada to get the Canadian data, I couldn't get a nice picture like this. It looks similar, but it's less extreme in, in, in Canada. Um, but so you see, look, most of the people are way at the bottom of the scale and ignore the last two bars because they changed the bin size there. And they changed the bin size because those are people making, sorry, uh, 200,000 and above and then 250,000 and above, or 200, 200 250, and then, two, um, yeah, 250 and, and above. And if you actually uh, made the graph properly, it would stretch like over to this wall here with all the outliers making like, you know, huge amounts of money. Um, anyway, but you get the idea, right? So this skew tells you something uh, interesting and sad uh, about uh, the US uh, economy and, and the wealth distribution. Uh, here's the opposite skew. This is uh, a test I gave my psychology students at the last institution um, uh, where I was working. I have not yet given a test to any students at this institution, so we'll see how you guys stack up. Um, but, you know, you can see it's the opposite skew, right? I was a small liberal arts elite college. Most of the kids there are really pretty uh, smart and also pretty dedicated, and so they mostly did good. There's always that person uh, down there, um, but you get the idea. Okay, why am I showing you this? I hope it's obvious already, right? A brain with mostly specialized regions will have this kind of skew. Right? It'll look like US household income. A brain with more functionally diverse regions will look more like the test scores at Franklin Marshall College. Uh, here are the results of one study. This one, basically, the, the methods here, I showed you the kind of the diversity measure, but the methods here are pretty simple. I go voxel by voxel. There's location by location in the brain. Um, I draw a sphere around it of various sizes. I think this particular sphere is a nine millimeter sphere, but we use six and nine and 12 and various things. Um, and then you count the number of activations. Well, then this is, remember, that big database of neuroimaging experiments. And you count the number of activations in that sphere in how many categories. You run it through the chain of entropy and you get this result. Now, this result surprised even us with who expected the regions to be diverse. It's much more skewed than we expected. So we tried various things to make that go away, right? Um, we did different, did, you know, different task categories. We let diversity values drive the task categories. Like suppose we didn't know what the categories were psychologically, but let's let's try to make the brain modular. Um, there is one way to make the brain modular uh, that way, uh, which is to make everything one region <laughs> um, in one category, but that's the only way to do it. You can't really get this uh, this this uh, this picture to go away. Uh, to give you a little more context here, um, so this particular say this particular run used eleven task categories. Again, I've done it with thirty some out and twenty some out and different ones and so on. Um, the qualitatively, the results always come out the same way. Uh, um, all, these spider plots are also going to come up uh, a couple of times. Somebody oriented to those. So uh, those are the 11 task categories, emotion, action, language, uh, various sorts, and so on. Um, the distance out of that dark line along each of those axes, right, pointing to those numbers, is the relative proportion of activations observed in each of those task categories, okay? So uh, that 0.88 there, that's a, left, a, a box on left anterior insula. That's a very highly diverse area. It's activated in basically everything except vision. Okay, that's unusual for the brain. You can see where that lands on the histogram, right? It's pretty far up uh, north, as it were. Um, uh, but there's quite a bit of the brain still that's like that. Um, in contrast, that voxel 0.41 is a voxel from left auditory cortex. That's a relative specialist, okay? Uh, so it's almost only activated in, in, in auditory tasks and with a little bit in, in action and in, uh, uh, you know, uh, language other than semantics. But as you can also see from its position on the histogram, almost nothing in the brain is like that, right? Uh, 0.76 is about the median uh, for this distribution, and that's that voxel from left thalamus. And you can see that, again, it's activated to some degree in uh, several of the different uh, task categories, right? And that's, as it were, a typical region of the brain, right, active across. And these are very different kinds of things, right? Uh, somesthesis, uh, and action and, um, uh, again, uh, language of various kinds, um, uh, attention tasks, right? So these are at least on the face quite, quite <coughs> diverse. Yeah, Rich.
Well, I, I certainly uh, that would uh, contribute to public misunderstanding of brain architecture. I hope it's not still contributing to scientific misunderstanding of brain architecture, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, anyway, so here, here's these are the functional fingerprints, the spider plots from a, 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 you know, a different run of this same thing, same idea. The, 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 the point I want to make here, and I will come back to these uh, in a little bit, uh, but they should be read the same way. Um, functional differentiation is an absolute important fact about the brain. Right? Not every piece of the brain does the same thing as every other piece of the brain. Like it's, not, it's not a holistic system in that sense. But all the evidence we have for functional uh, differentiation, which is valid evidence for differentiation, has been taken to be evidence for functional specialization. And in fact, it was never evidence for functional specialization. Right? That, that was driven by an assumption about what the architecture was, which is a modular architecture. And so when you fall, saw functional differentiation, that, that, that frame caused people to interpret the evidence for differentiation as evidence for functional specialization. If you, if you start to drill down beneath that, uh, then you see that you know, that inference is actually not valid. Yeah. Was it used yeah. as uh, another way of looking at the differentiation? Ah, well, okay, so, so see these, these are oh, they're, they're spider plots, and you, you read these by, in this case, it's the, the sort of the middle line, those are confidence intervals around it, but that middle green line um, tells you the relative proportion of activations of a particular voxel in the brain to uh, tasks in all those different conditions. There's 20 some odd, uh, 24 I think in this particular case. What the, what, what's actually being shown here are <coughs> voxels from um, six different regions of the insula. So dorsal anterior, posterior, uh, uh, um, dorsal anterior, posterior, dorsal and ventral anterior and posterior insula. So these are six voxels from right and left uh, insula. So even though it's the same structure in some sense, right, um, it's all part of the insula, these three divisions, or, or six divisions, all look different from one another, even though they're, they neighbor each other in the brain. That is, they're likely to, to act under a different set of circumstances. So, or, or put it differently, they're involved in a different um, uh, collection of cognitive activities. Right? And so they're different from one another, functionally speaking. They have some underlying causal powers, you might call it, um, that allows them to participate in some cognitive functions but not others, or causes them to participate in some cognitive functions but not others. And that's different across the brain. And you can actually quantify that difference. I'll talk a little bit about that later, because, I mean, well, I can just say it because it's quite simple. Now, these are just vectors, right? This is just a string of numbers, right? So 20 some odd numbers. So it's a vector in a multi dimensional space. And you, actually, you can actually then quantify the actual functional difference between regions, right? Uh, by, by computing the vector, the vector difference. Right. So you, you, know, you can capture and quantify these things, uh, which will be important I think, in, in a little bit. But that's the idea. So th these aren't specialized, at least not in the way we thought, uh, uh, but they are different from one another. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's sort of some of the data uh, establishing the kind of functional complexity of the individual parts of the brain. Uh, I also want to emphasize brain dynamics. Um, right? So there's constant rapid neuromodulation that is changes in network structure at multiple spatial sp scales, right? Genetic, cellular, and systemic. And that's crucial to the brain's functioning that this is true. Uh, it wouldn't be crucial to the brain's function if the brain were modular, right? Then you'd expect something much more stable, right? Because if you have uh, parts with stable input-output interactions, then cognitive function would be a, way, uh, a matter of finding the right uh, uh, way to put together the system like an automobile engine and you don't want your automobile engine to be changing its connections all the time. That would not get you to work on time. Um, but, uh, so if we had a modular system like, like, like an engine, uh, we would not expect uh, the, the degree of diversity we in fact see in the brain. Anyway, the idea here is that cognitive function, um, successful cognitive function, is a matter of dynamically assembling distributed neural coalitions. Right? So moment to moment changes in patterns of cooperation. Um, So how do we know? Well, again, here's one kind of evidence. I'll point you to other kinds of evidence. Um, but we can do a functional connectivity analysis. Right? So here, the strategy is to look for evidence of statistical dependence in the activity of different brain regions. Right? And the results of such analyses can be represented as a graph. And here again, here's a little tutorial, because I, I, I don't know what, what and who will know what a graph is and how to read them. But it's quite simple. A graph is just a mathematical object, uh, a set of nodes joined by edges. So here's an example. 
Here's a partial airline route map. Here the nodes are airports or cities, uh, and the edges are uh, flights between those, those nodes. Right? So as you can tell by the fact that it's centered out in Atlanta, this is a fragment of the Delta network. Right? Um, uh, there are social networks, right? and, and here um, uh, the nodes are uh, people or accounts, and edges indicate uh, friendship, whatever that's come to mean in our day and age, uh, or uh, some kind of link between, it, between accounts. Um, and by the way, you probably know this, but uh, uh, graphs are actually what are behind your ability to make reservations on airlines, right? And graphs are what's actually behind Facebook and allows them to target ads to you and your friends, right? So these aren't, aren't just ways of representing things. They, they have actual practical uses. Anyway, here's a brain graph. Um, this is diffusion tensor imaging, um, where now, now the uh, uh, nodes are parts of the brain, and the edges indicate uh, white matter connectivity between them. There's actually more information here that's not relevant to us, but just so you know, um, the size of the red dot, which is the region of the brain, indicates its, uh, its degree of connectivity. Right? So the bigger the dot, the more connected it is, the more central it is in some sense. Uh, and the thickness of the line indicates the amount of connectivity between, between the nodes. So there's, you can put more information in these graphs. I'm only going to talk about the basic structure for, for our purposes here. So here's a set of nodes. Uh, this is your brain. This is actually what this is. This is a, this is a set of nodes. Uh, you can sort of see this in the 3D space. Um, we're looking at the brain from the top, and the front of the brain is at the top of the screen, and the bottom of the brain, the back of the brain is at the bottom of the screen. Um, and what these are, these are spheres that are uh, centered at the uh, anatomical coordinates from the whatever it is, 118 regions in the Harvard uh, Oxford uh, anatomical atlas. Okay, so um, you know those are the names, right? So left and right frontal pole, you can't read that, but. They all have names. Anyway, so what I did, again, is I, I um, looked in the database using those regions as my nodes and looked for evidence of statistical, statistical dependence um, uh, between the activity of the regions. So how likely is it if one area is active in a particular experiment that some other area will be active, right? And so this is a chi-squared for those who care. Um, but that's, that's the basic idea. And so if it's, more, if it's statistically unlikely, uh, more likely than uh, by chance um, uh, that they would be, they are co-active, um, then you draw a line between them. That's what the edge means here. And so here's the, um, the co-activation graph for semantics tasks. So things having to do with linguistic meaning. Now, I, I kind of, I like talking about these graphs. Um, so, and I'm up here. Um, but what's nice about this for me is that you get that left lateralization, which is something we would expect to see in a, a semantics graph, right? And the, partly that's an artifact, by the way, that most language studies use right-handed participants exclusively, right? In left-handed participants, you get much less lateralization. But nevertheless, it at least uh, speaks to our, uh, our, our expectation that uh, the language network should be left lateralized, okay? So the data support that. Uh, that notion, but of course, what's striking to me in this graph is how much sort of cross colossal connectivity there is, right? Semantics tasks activate and pull, you know, draw into activation a lot of the brain and, and a highly distri distributed network in the brain. Um, uh, here is uh, a graph for emotion tasks. Uh, again, similar to the semantics one, uh, you see that density of connections in the middle? Well, those are all the subcortical areas, right? That suggest, what, again, what we expect to see the, the uh, high importance of subcortical regions of the brain to emotion. Okay. But what's striking, and this is actually the most highly connected graph of the ones I looked at, what's striking is how much of the brain, as it were, cares about emotion or, or responds to emotion. Right? This is maybe not surprising, uh, but it's nevertheless uh, not the kind of thing that typically gets reflected in, in, in psychological treatments of, of emotion uh, and, and, and emotion regulation and things. Um, Here's a, a task-driven attention task. Once again, we see this kind of uh, 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 right frontal uh, orientation of the graph that suggests you know, the importance of those regions to executive control of, of various kinds. But once again, now this is a fairly sparse graph, but once again, you get lots of different regions of the brain uh, cooperating in a particular set of patterns. So as I said, if, well, oh, I think I have the, right. So we can compare these graphs in various ways. Uh, you can compare the network topology, right? So you could, like in the delta graph, when you see a hub that is something that's highly connected, that's significant uh, for various reasons. If you disrupt Atlanta, you really screw up air travel uh, for delta. 
In other words, if you disrupt Chicago, you're going to screw up air travel for United, but not for Delta. And that could tell you something interesting about brains, too. You find things that are highly connected, you realize that disrupting those things is going to uh, have much more significant consequences than more, as it were, provincial nodes. Um, and this can be, this is in fact empirically demonstrated. Uh, anyway, but the thing I'm interested in is node versus edge overlap, and why is that? Well, I think you can kind of read it again off these very highly schematic or abstract graphs. What should we expect for those measures? For node overlap, like do, how many, are, are the nodes used in multiple cognitive domains? And edge overlap, are they, uh, are they cooperating in the same set of uh, partnerships? Uh, if, you're, if the brain is modular, then you'd expect very low node overlap. There'll be some, but, but it'd be low. Um, and if you don't have node overlap, you can't have edge overlap, right? Uh, if you have a kind of a holistic brain where everything is used all the time, you'd expect both high node and high edge overlap. Uh, and if you have a brain that's marked by neural reuse, right, this notion that uh, regions of the brain are used in multiple uh, different circumstances but cooperate with different partners in each, uh, then you'd expect a, a high um, a node overlap and low edge overlap. But as, uh, to give you some sense visually of how this is going to come out, I'm highlighting left precentral gyrus and its particular partners under these different conditions, right? Um, so those are the partners of left precentral gyrus uh, during semantics tasks. Uh, those are the partners during emotion tasks. And those are the partners during attention tasks. I'll do it again because it's fun. Um, but you can sort of see, I think, that the way the, the fan of connections changes as we look at these different uh, uh, cognitive uh, domains um, suggests that right, we, you, we have the same region involved in all three of these domains, but have different partners in each. And of course, you can quantify that. So here's just putting on a, on a, a regular old graph um, the prediction. So here's what you predict uh, if it, a brain is modular. Here's what you predict if the brain is holistically organized. That's what you predict if the brain is marked by reuse. And uh, those are the actual uh, results of this, of this study. Um, uh, those are the error bars. These are definitely very different. Uh, they're definitely coming from very different distributions. The, if you care, if you, SPSS will just tell you the p-value is zero. But if you put it into Excel just for fun, it turns out that the p-value is 6.02 times 10 to the negative 23rd. So this is inverse Avogadro's number, interestingly enough. <laughs> okay, look, so this is an example, uh, or this is evidence for um, large-scale neuromodulation. Right? Um, it's sort of system level neuromodulation. Uh, and I, I want to tell you, right, and this is not my work anymore, but um, uh, there's, there's compelling evidence for ubiquitous neuromodulation at all spatial scales. And so I'll just direct you to a few labs Corey Bargeman, Danny Bassett, Todd Braver, Eve Martyr. Go to any of their websites and look at, uh, look at a selection of their papers, and you'll start to see this uh, sort of massive evidence for neuromodulation um, at, at multiple spatial scales. So here's something from, from Corey Bargeman's lab. She works with um, a C. elegans, right? The soil nematode C. elegans. It has a highly stereotyped nervous system, uh, uh, which we have completely mapped. Um, and what is being shown here, uh, so from a distance, you probably can't read the letters, but the colors of those, uh, those triangles indicate the same neuron in different networks, right? So each triangle represents a neuron uh, in the, the uh, C. elegans uh, nervous system. And then the connections between them uh, indicate patterns of cooperation or, or network structure under various conditions. So the first one is octanol avoidance. They don't like octanol, uh, so they move away from it. And those are the neurons that are involved in that. The, the second is aerotaxis. They do need air, so they, they seek, seek out uh, air. Those are the neurons that are involved in that. Um, the, the third uh, C down at the bottom, that's, a, that's um, uh, aggregation and repulsion behavior. They have, the, they have a kind of simple social behavior. So they aggregate into clumps, and then they get sick of each other, and they get repulsed, and right. Uh, and so that red, just focus on the red neuron, ASH, right? It's involved in all of these different behaviors of the animal, right? But it's cooperating with different partners in all these different behaviors, right? So even at the level of a soil nematode, single neurons, we get reuse. Um, uh, and this is all modulated, by the way, by genetic expression. So genetic expression, NPR1 in particular, uh, is turning on and off actual synaptic connections between these neurons. And, and there's evidence for that kind of synaptic modulation in humans uh, as, as well, although it's much less studied for probably obvious reasons. I'm going to skip this. This is a different kind, different kind of neuromodulation, uh, non-synaptic diffusion uh, transmission. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yep. 
No, that's that, and that's right. But that's that's okay. And um, the, the so that that what the white matter does is that is part of the set of constraints on what kinds of partnerships are available, right? And then neuromodulation. Uh, so that and neural research, I think, is kind of a neural search process when you learn something new that finds the available partnerships and consolidates them down through learning. And then neuromodulation is what helps you swap between different networks for different tasks. Uh, so, so that's right. That's an important constraint on on, uh, on what the artificial could possibly be. But as I say, the important point here is the fact that we get the different <coughs> networks under different circumstances instead of having a, one sort of stable set of components connected in a particular set of ways that you know give give will give rise to a, a set of behaviors. Okay, so in outline then, so far, um, we got brain regions are functionally diverse because of the way function evolved and develops, right, through, uh, so there, are, and there are at least two developmental principles at work here, experience-driven heavy and plasticity, right, we heard a little bit about this uh, this morning already, right, the changes in the strength of synaptic connection between individual neurons, and also, I think, neuro-reuse, which is acts at a, a higher, more systemic level, uh, uh, right, putting together uh, pieces on, in, different, uh, in different coalitions, and then function then, behavior, is a matter of dynamically assembling distributed neural coalitions in real time. These facts call for different empirical approaches, I think, than are typically being used in the cognitive neurosciences. And, and um, so let me just uh, finish with a very briefly, um, right, some basic brain facts. Three now, the brain is highly plastic, right? That is, it's the job of the brain to allow an organism to behaviorally adapt to its environment. Uh, and by the way, the environment is itself sort of multi uh, level, right? That can be individual environment, an ecological environment, a cultural environment, at least for some species, linguistic environment, an emotional environment, um, uh, right? So we can think of environments uh, uh, in, uh, in multiple ways as well. Anyway, and I think, as I said, I think there are at least two kinds of mechanisms of plasticity, heavy and plasticity and neural reuse. And, and just here's my note of Bene at the bottom there. I'm distinguishing be between plasticity and dynamics in terms of time scale and function. What I want to suggest is that dynamics selects among available coalitions, and heavy plasticity and neural reuse establish what coalitions are available to select between. I recognize, however, that that distinction can't be considered absolute, right? But I want to just make that kind of a conceptual distinction. Okay, so I already said this, right? This is heavy plasticity, neural reuse, right? Establishes multiple overlapping coalitions for different purposes. We've already seen some of the evidence favoring reuse over modularity, so I won't uh, belabor that point there. So now th this brings me to the, what I think of as the reproducibility challenge that all this presents. <coughs> so here's what could have been the case. Right? We could have had a neurofunctional architecture determined largely by genetic predisposition. Right? Uh, this this, this is, uh, you know, remains one possible um, position in, in, in a logical possibility space, right? the maturational viewpoint, if you've heard of this. Nancy Canrusher is, is one big advocate that right, no, the brain just gets wired up because of, of a genetic program unfolding, um, and you know, experiences isn't as important as, as people think it is. Um, right, we just have these. It's, it's, it's. I won't say what I think of that view, um, but it's a view, and it's been defended by very prominent scientists. So that could have been the case, and, and it is a logical possibility that could have been the case. And in this case, we'd expect variability in brain architecture no greater than or constrained by underlying genetic variability in the species. Right? Um, and so it would be easy to imagine a stable species typical central tendency, uh, and that, could, that would be then the target of neuroscientific investigation. Right? What does a species typical central tendency look like, and how, how, how do we understand it? And modular brains are probably, could at least be one candidate for that, for that idea. But what seems to be the case instead is that individual experience plays an important role in shaping local organization, different functional characteristics of local nodes influence the formation of distributed networks and vice versa. Uh, and it's, what's, it's easy to imagine that these degrees of freedom leading to significant variance and no stable species typical exemplar, right? So the question then, the challenge is, can there even be a reproducible cognitive neuroscience, at least as currently conceived? Uh, so here's just some su super simple examples of, of this variability that you see in neural uh, uh, organization but not in behavior. So here's just a simple um, uh, task that they're teaching squirrel monkeys um, basically a, a sort of a digit and wrist flexion um, sort of manipulation that they're teaching them. And then these colors here represent the neurons and how they map to the various uh, uh, joints, right? So uh, the red are the digits, the, the green are the wrist and forearm, and, and so on, right? The, the, the basic thing to take away from this is that 
there's the baseline organization. And then, then that's how it reorganizes during training for this task. Then you extinguish the behavioral tendency to do this task and we reorganize the system again. And then we reacquire the ability to do this task and they, can, they right, reach criteria on this task, but the organization of the brain doesn't look like it looked during training one or training two. Right? And, and this also would be the case, and this is a single individual uh, monkey. Of course, this is gonna be different between monkeys as well. Uh, and I can show you data sort of like that. This is a fMRI study for humans um, and, and two ways of looking at this particular uh, task, which is just looking at matched pictures versus pictures that are related in some way. So you can look at the relations versus the baseline. Baseline is probably, I forget now, to be honest. I think baseline is probably just fixation cross. Okay, maybe I back up one. Here's the logic of, of many uh, uh, neuroimaging uh, experiments. Um, you put somebody in a scanner, you have a psychological task in mind for them. Uh, in this case, it's looking at uh, deciding whether pictures are related or, or, or exact matches. Um, uh, you look at the activity of the brain while they do this task. Uh, you compare it sometimes in different ways. So this, this first picture says, well, when they look at uh, pictures that are related uh, versus when they're just looking at a fixation cross, what if I subtract what the brain looks like under one uh, uh, under the, the, the task versus what it looks like under the, under the baseline uh, condition. And here are the regions of activation, right? So uh, uh, the red, the, the hot colors uh, are um, higher than uh, average uh, uh, activation uh, under the uh, uh, relation task versus baseline and the blue, the cool colors are lower than uh, typical activation, right? Um, and then we have a stricter subtraction which is um, between the two task conditions relations versus matches, and that's what you see on the bottom. And same, same thing, hot colors mean it's more active than uh, average, and cool colors mean it's uh, uh, less active than average. Okay, so uh, what, you, the, what, what you're looking at on, on your left there is what you typically see in a journal article in the cognitive neurosciences showing you which parts of the brain are involved in, uh, in these various attractions, okay? What you see on the right, however, it's now the, the hot colors mean the percentage of individuals in the experiment that actually show activation at those locations, right? And so for the less strict one, you get relatively decent matching between the number of individuals showing uh, activation, uh, right, at those things, th at those regions, and what you see in the, uh, the less strict subtraction. But, but what strikes me about this uh, particular result is the, the bottom right picture. Right, that's the number of individuals showing activation at those regions, um, uh, the percentage of individuals showing activation at those regions in the stricter, in the stricter subtraction, and basically nobody shows activation at the regions. Right, so if we if we drill down to the level of individual brain architectures, we're looking at significant individual difference. Right, the, the, nobody shows activations at the reported group averages. Right. So this is, this is you know, an important failure of uh, reproducibility. And individual differences often have functional con consequences. So in a visual imagery task, um, high performers uh, include Broadman Area 17 in their uh, network that uh, is involved in this task, whereas low performers uh, instead don't use 17 but, uh, but incorporate parietal regions. Why are these differences, uh, uh, why do these differences show up? There could be lots of reasons. The most likely is, um, Basically, we've got path dependencies here, right? Different individuals learn different things at different times. They incorporate whatever networks uh, uh, are available to them as they learn the new things. That makes the things that are incorporated less available to other kinds of networks, right? And so the brain sort of makes do as it, as it goes and learns the task as best it can under, you know, given its current architecture and what's available to it to, to change its, its architecture. Um, and, you know, in, in addition, uh, people who show more network flexibility, and you can, you can look at uh, this by doing those kind of graphs that I showed you and then seeing how much those graphs change uh, uh, during a learning task. And um, uh, network flexibility, so higher, cha uh, higher plasticity in those changes actually predicts higher learning gain as well. Right? So these individual differences have functional consequences. But, but not always, right? So in, in an interesting study, Braille readers, and these are sighted individuals, by the way, who learn Braille while being blindfolded, uh, they, they show the ability to spontaneously switch networks, right? So, so uh, when they're blindfolded, they use a network of regions to do the real reading task that includes visual, you know, primary visual areas. Uh, when you remove the blindfold, well, now primary visual areas are occupied, 
Uh, and you might expect, ah, well, now they got to read them in the task, but interestingly enough, they don't. They just spontaneously switch to a different network without any decrement in behavioral right, function, which there's interesting implications of that uh, in terms of, of how many networks get set up, how much redundancy there actually might be in the system. Uh, but I don't have much more information about that. Uh, here's some more data. Um, and, and this is um, looking at uh, doing these, building these connectivity graphs uh, for multiple in individuals. Um, what, what strikes me is that uh, the between participant correlation, the R squared, so between individuals, there's only five people here, but the, the, the individual to individual correlation is uh, R squared is 0.65. So significant correlation, but still a lot of variance left unexplained, right? Um, and then, interestingly also, the within participant uh, correlation with a two day delay, we're not talking very much time, is only 0.78, right? So you're slightly more correlated with yourself than you are with your neighbor, but not all that much, right? So we have pretty significant individual variability here. And similarly, this is just a different uh, measure of network stability. Uh, same day within subject uh, variability, we get R squares ranging from 0.49 um, to 0.9. Um, those drop significantly over five to 16 months delays, right? To 0.36 to 0.81. Uh, again, depending on the, the which subjects, and much bigger study, by the way, right, n equals 26 here. So that's striking. Those individual differences are striking. What's also striking to me is the massively high uh, group average correlations. R squares of 0.97, and in a different study, we get R squares of like 0.99. We have, we have sort of really significant individual variation, right, uh, and variation over time, but the group averages are rock solid stable. So this is, this is, I think, a, a data point in need of explanation. Uh, basically, different measure of the same idea, same kind of, same kind of results here. Uh, right, so uh, this pattern results appears to indicate significant inter- and intra-individual variability, but around some kind of species-typical prototype. Why might this be? Well, one option that, that Barb Finley and I have put forward is something uh, along the lines of an evo-devo account of brain plasticity. Um, one of the things that does seem to be highly genetically driven uh, is uh, the sensory afferents, right? So the sensory afferent, where sensory afferents go during development is highly sort of canalized, right? So you get you know, projections from your eyes and your ears uh, going to the same parts of the brain in basically everybody. Well, so what, what that means is insofar as experience is important uh, to, uh, to uh, shaping network uh, structure, and, and we have lots of evidence that it is, and you get highly stereotyped sensory afferent placement, then you're likely to get, and you have a conserved environment for the most part, then you're likely to get in early development the same kinds of network structures being uh, induced in the same brain regions for everybody. And if you have the same uh, uh, network structures in the same brain regions for everybody in very early development, then when you start to put these things together in, in coalitions, right, the same kind of things are going to be available in early development. And again, there's a lot of assumptions here about how similar the environment is and how similar the developmental trajectory is going to be. Uh, and so that you might expect cross-cultural variation here. Um, uh, but nevertheless, you would expect then some highly similar neural architectures to emerge, right? You've got the same building blocks, the same uh, behavioral developmental challenges to overcome, and so you put them together often in very similar configurations. The fact is we don't actually have very much data on reproducibility in the cognitive neurosciences. We use group data often and, and whatnot. But, so let me just close with a few suggestions for how to me capture and measure it. Oh, what time did I start? Yeah, quarter of okay. Yeah. Um, remember these things, right? Um, what I want to say is this is a way of indexing the functional biases of particular regions of the brain, right? So this is, would be a way to capture, ah, what is it that particular regions of the brain can do as they're being sculpted by experience over time, right? So I call these, these functional biases. Um, and again, as I mentioned, you can measure the similarity of these uh, functional biases. Right, so we can quantify the similarity. Um, and you know, it leads, leads to some interesting discoveries, including network functional assorti assortativity. That is, uh, 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 regions with similar functional biases tend to actually form coalitions with one another. Um, 
But of course, as I mentioned, th these things can also be uh, applied to measure inter and inter individual differences. And as I also mentioned, functional fingerprints are multidimensional vectors. Why is that important? Well, because then you can do fun mathematical things to them, right? Like matrix decomposition uh, or other kinds of dimensional reduction techniques. And then you can measure the reproducibility of the underlying structure, right? So again, instead, well, I'll get there in a sec. Um, so I, you know, you could call these sort of neural response profile factors like this. This, this is uh, by analogy with like personality studies, right? You take a bunch of characteristics of individuals, you see which characteristics tend to hang together, and you suggest that's a kind of personality factor, right? You can do the same thing here. We've got a bunch of char functional characteristics um, of individual parts of the brain. We can do dimensional reduction on those things and see if there's some underlying structure. Um, uh, to those things. Here's a, a, a proof of concept of this uh, coming out of Russ Poldrack's lab where they looked at um, eight different, uh, eight different uh, task uh, paradigms um, and then shoved it through a, a six-node uh, six hidden, uh, a neural network with a six-node hidden layer. Uh, so you, but you don't have to do it that way. You can do it various other ways. Anyway, and then what they did is they found those, those six dimensions um, and, and how those dimensions map onto the original tasks, right? This is a way of trying to get at what's uh, uh, lurking under the hood in our psychological tasks from the standpoint of neural responses. Um, and so we got six dimensions. Here's the one I want to point out to you for current purposes because I, I think it, 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 it's really interesting and it'd be worth kind of think, talking it through. So dimension six is that the purple dimension, basically only response inhibition Right, loads on dimension six, right? So that, oops, that's here, okay? And okay, so that's the only one that, that's showing any kind of, uh, of load on that particular uh, underlying uh, structural dimension of these data. And indeed, if we do the reverse thing, we see, um, and this is just from uh, an analysis of the descriptions of, of, the, uh, of the experiments, we see that dimension six, like, right, response inhibition uh, itself loads highly on dimension six. Okay, so there's, there's some kind of a, a crosstalk happening here. Um, but what's, I think, striking, and I'll, I'll emphasize this in a second, response inhibition, that's the, uh, right, that's the original um, experiment that loads highly on response inhibition which so that looks like it could be its own little psychological factor, but response inhibition also loads highly on almost all the other factors. So response inhibition turns out to be more, we presume, psychologically neural complex, right, then I can, well, back to sort of Jackie's point, then the construct right, might have us initially believe. Now, how stable are these NRP factors? That's a totally open question. I don't uh, have an answer uh, to that. Um, but they do demonstrably capture the important variants in brain activation, right? You can use these, uh, uh, you know, I've done this kind of work as well. Um, uh, you, can, you can find the underlying variation. You can use that, uh, that, those underlying factors to do things like if you knock out a brain region from a particular experiment uh, with something like uh, 70 to 80% reliability, these, the, this structure will tell you you need to put it back. There's something missing here. Uh, you can do the reverse. You can use it to predict under a particular task paradigm what kind of brain regions should be activated given its dimensional structure. So it actually could be used for, as a tool for, for, for discovery, I think, as well. Um, and, they, and they contain less noise than, than, than uh, you know, as it were, base level uh, cognitive neuroscience neuroimaging data. And again, I've mentioned this already. I, I, I've argued that we should use these to better represent the function of the brain in terms of, of different factor loads, right? So then as we should quantify, capture and quantify the neural personalities, right? Instead of these one-to-one -one functional mappings, right? Let's instead, instead say, ah, well, this, this part of the brain loads in these ways on, on this set of, of uh, neural, um, neuroscientifically relevant psychological factors, right? And then we can measure the inter, inter, inter intra, should have said, individual re reproducibility uh, of, of those. Um, and I don't, I don't have a, a strong prediction for how that's going to go, but I think what we've seen um, is that the reproducibility of what we're doing now is seriously in question. And insofar as we care about uh, reproducibility, we need a different target, because the thing we're targeting now is demonstrably not reproducible. 
neither across individuals nor within individuals. All right, so let's do something different. So those are some suggestions for what different thing we might try. So bottom line, brain is a plastic dynamic system with a great deal of inter and intra individual variability. I think mechanisms are likely stable across individuals. I haven't given you an argument for that, um, but I suspect like uh, that mechanisms at multiple uh, scales, right? So the mechanism of, 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 of uh, synaptic plasticity and the mechanisms of uh, uh, certain kinds of development, those are likely to be stable across individuals, but the resulting architecture is, de is definitely not, right? And let me just emphasize before I f finish the next two points here, those two points together, again, I think suggest that at least insofar as what cognitive neuroscience has been after, is some kind of stable neurofunctional architecture. Right? That's been its target, that it's barking up an irreproducible tree. Right? That shouldn't be what, where the science is going. Right? So here, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, what I want to suggest is that the particular kinds of failures of reproducibility we're seeing, given the particular kind of architecture and uh, development of principles we appear to be, that appear to be implicated in the architecture of the brain, suggest that the target of the science should be something different than it currently is. Um, happily, however, there is reason to expect reproducible species typical prototypes, averages. Uh, and then, as I said, I've given some, and there are others, there are empirical methods to capture and quantify both similarity and difference. And so one way you might think of what the proper target of a, of a, of a much more mature cognitive neuroscience should be is understanding the various developmental principles and the way those interact uh, uh, with, uh, with each other and, and with environmental um, uh, conditions that then can explain both the species-typical average and the individual variations. Right? So in other words, the target of the science should be something like the variation and not merely the notion that there's going to be some uh, you know, universally shared, uh, 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 right, uh, individually represented neurocognitive architecture. And that's all we got. Fascinating. The most startling example that I know of of neuroplasticity and neuroimmunes and it fits in with what you're saying is recent research by Alyssa Newport. Uh, it turns out that quite a few individuals due to brain damage at birth grow up without a hemisphere. It's just missing. They grow up normally and it's only discovered that they're missing a hemisphere when they're scanned later in life for some other reason. And they are more or less normal. So you could be interested to add the neural circuits that you find to your database. I mean, it's sort of remarkable that you can do it out of hemisphere. You know, it's, uh, somehow it works. <laughs> Just about the no, yeah, that's absolutely yeah. No, it's... Yes, uh, I like very much the network analysis, and uh, I use a lot of network analysis, so my... My question is a technical one, which I'm, I would like uh, to know because it's very uh, fascinating. As you know, the two central indicators are the degree centrality, which you asked the one which uh, most uh, mm -hmm. knows and links to that one. But the other one, which is the most end that I would like to see there, is the betweenness centrality, mm -hmm. which is the case where you have an inter gate, which is the pass through of most people. So yes. betweenness centrality should be very fine to see in which task, or is it a, 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 a stable between less or a changing one or so like the, you, you show the, the, the degree central to change a lot like that, which yeah. is a lot of stuff. So what about the between less central? Uh, um, so I have not looked at that except in one case. So this is joint work with Lucina Uden, uh, Luis Pessoa, and, and Ken and, and uh, Kennison. Uh, and we were interested in, in Insula and whether or not Insula were the hub, as is often uh, 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 thought to be the case. And indeed, it does seem to be uh, a hub by both uh, by both metrics, and that those metrics change relative to one another depending on on the tasks that are being switched between. And I think it's, uh, I'll get you another reference too. The, the name isn't coming to me right now, but somebody out of Wash U has done a similar thing, talked about flexible hubs. Uh, and so yeah, what you see is that there are uh, uh, 
node high between the centrality that seems to be um, highly important to the switching of the network configuration, which is pretty much what you'd expect. Yeah, but there is nice evidence for that. Um, I enjoyed this very much. Um, uh, one of my naive reactions is that this kind of like replicability is not a problem. It's not like the dormant of the replication crisis. It's just a. No, I agree with that. And, and part of the point was here's a kind of system for which we fit failure replication that doesn't shouldn't cause a crisis, but it does, should cause a rethinking of the of the target uh, the proper target of the science. Yeah, it also led me to wonder whether um, some of the challenges we're having in understanding the genetics mm -hmm. of things could be um, approached in the same kind of way. Well, absolutely, and in fact, some of this work was inspired by work in genetics. I mean, I think they're, they're quite a bit ahead of the neuroscience community in understanding the importance of gene-gene interactions and that there aren't these simple one-to-one -one mappings between genes and pheno gene hub and phenotype, right? That instead, you've got to understand gene networks and individual genes are, are parts of multiple networks. And so they, they really sort of pioneered the use of network analysis uh, in genetics before, before we started doing it in neuroscience. Um, the, there are a number of uh, puzzling things that come up, for example, in the genetics of mental illness, where uh -huh. um, it looks like the same genes are involved in very different mental illnesses, like schizophrenia and bipolar. Right. Uh, and that's thrown that one for a loop, and maybe right. then maybe the classifications are wrong. But right. actually. But I, again, so I don't, I don't know very much about that, uh, unfortunately. Um, but my prediction, based on just general. Um, my general sense of how these things work is the place to look there is not then that we've got the mappings wrong, but that instead we need to look at the differences in the interactions, and those will account for the differences in the phenotypic expression. Let me answer the question you didn't ask, and then the one you did. Um, just by way of saying, so the, the, uh, the variability uh, measures, uh, all those metrics came from network analyses, uh, so not functional ones. Right? That was just looking at uh, network connectivity as measured by uh, various metrics, but usually diff diffusion tensor imaging, or in one of the cases it was um, looking at the stability of the, the hub rankings, Right, getting back to the question over here, how stable, are, so if this is a, has a, a degree of 100 and the next one is 45, and how stable are those rankings across time? Um, and you see variability there. So th th that's where that came from. So these aren't functional me measures. Back to the, the question. Um, in fact, here in 2016, we had a workshop uh, on exactly this question, which is uh, what if this is an artifact of the, the fact that our psychological categories are just cross-cutting uh, what's really going on, and can we use uh, the neuroscience data to actually push around the categories? Can we come up with new categories? Can we get rid of old categories? Um, so one of the people who was uh, at that conference, Russ Poldrack, whose work I, I, I put up there, thinks that that is in fact the case, that the problem is our psychological constructs are screwed up, and, and there's good reason to think that might be true, uh, at least for a neuroscience, because after all, Cognitive psychology is highly dominated by the, the computer, you know, basic computational theory of mind, and was designed to be a science autonomous from neuroscience. So that it came up with constructs that explain certain things but don't match up with neuroscience data, you know, you might, you shouldn't be surprised that that's the case. 
But if we care about a cognitive neuroscience, that might mean we need a different set of psychological constructs that, that better, um, uh, that's more reproducible, right, for the, he thinks that's going to happen. Uh, I don't, for various reasons. I, I think that the functional complexity is going to be irreducible. We can probably in, indeed come up with better psychological constructs. And one way to do that is the, like the dimensional reduction methods and things like that on the neuroscience data. Uh, uh, but there are other ways you might kind of jumpstart that process. Um, and so, yeah, that, you know, this, this, this question of what, the, what the, is the proper taxonomy of psychology for the neurosciences is a, a big open question. And, and thankfully, there's now you know, quite a few people interested in it. So I thought that was a really good talk, and I think I basically agree with most of your arguments. Um, but? How, <laughs> well, I think it's just important to distinguish between um, like neurobiological modularity, which is what I think what your talk was about, and yeah. then cognitive modularity. And so um, you know, I think as you said yourself, there's like psychological constructs that are like species averages, things like theory of mind and advanced empathy and so on. And um, you know, I think it's hard to explain the Yeah, I think, I think it gets tricky here. Okay. First of all, you know, the, the word module is one of the most abused words in cognitive science. Which it's used to mean so many different things. So it's just base level confusing. And so uh, to really have a conversation about this, we need to sort of agree to fix the meaning at one thing and then investigate whether that's a reasonable construct to be using. Here, here's the, the, the issue, I think. Um, if the notion of module is to mean more than the organization at a particular moment that allows for full coherent function. It is to mean something more like a functionally dissociable um, uh, set of processes. Um, the, here's, here comes the issue. Um, uh, insofar as uh, whatever psychological process you're, uh, is of interest to you, say, in, in, say your, your psychological language module, if it's the case that each of those different processes is supported um, by different brain regions, and then those brain regions support lots of different psychological constructs, then you haven't then discovered what would in fact be a functionally dissociable module. You've discovered a domain of inquiry, right? And so as a domain of inquiry, absolutely, that's right. right? As an artifact that you want to use as a scientist right, to define what it is you're interested in, you can call that a module if you want, but it's really right, a domain of inquiry. But what you haven't done is found a functionally dissociable thing in the actual natural world. Uh, my question is a bit similar to William Solomon's question and the question is what's the problem? And, uh, yeah, so if you see experimentation as a complex uh, process that develops in, in space and time, then uh, as I said, you have to ask the question, reproducibility of what? And it's never the case that all kinds of aspects of that practice is only research are mm -hmm. useful. Let me just give two uh, examples from physics. So if you have, say, statistical mechanics of molecules, then uh, a lot of uh, features of the individual, of the movement of the individual molecules, they, they are not at all reproducible. But you can make, say, statistical averages, like uh, mm -hmm. the uh, average kinetic energy, and you can reproduce those. Another example is, say, uh, radioactive uh, atoms. So the, the time of decay of a radioactive atom, that, that cannot be reproduced. If it happens, uh, say, in a specific time, in, in one case, it tells you nothing about uh, the other cases. But you can look at the average time. So, and, uh, so it seems to me that, uh, that in this cognitive neurosciences, you mentioned three basic claims of which I suppose that they are, in my term, applicable. Namely, that uh, there is functional differentiation. The second is the brain is highly dynamic. And the third is the brain is highly plastic. So 
So, and then of course, uh, yeah, there is a lot of individual variation. So it makes sense to see whether there are in, in all kinds of complicated situations. Maybe there is some more reproducibility there. But given these three reproducible basic claims, you cannot be too optimistic about that. In fact, you know, this is exactly what you show. Yeah. But, but why is that a problem? Well, it, here's why it's a problem. And I think we sort of saw some of this in Jackie's talk as well, right? Yeah. The, it, there is currently, and not for everybody, right, obviously, yeah. there's the diversity of approaches and, and, and theoretical yeah. commitments across the neurosciences, of course. Yeah. But if you take, as it were, the, the neuroscientific typical average understanding, there's a mismatch between the guiding idealization being used in the cognitive neurosciences and what the data actually show. Right. So that's the system of the inadequate use. That's that's where the that's where the problem is. So you know, it, 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 why do you do lesion studies? Because you want to figure out what it does. But if this story is right, finding what it does is is, is a fool's errand, right? You want to find out what it does at what time in a given circumstance, and it's going to do multiple things. You can't just do one intervention of one experimental uh, condition, right? And and you know, experimental designs like the ones Jackie was talking about. Again, what's lying behind them? Our expectations for the stability of the architecture and the ability to get these really nice functional mappings. And I, I think that that uh, fails to understand the actual nature of the system. Yeah, so, so for, for me at least, the, the importance that there is a species typical average, uh, that's important because uh, otherwise we might see drift, right? And if this system is free to drift, right? Evolutionary. It, evolutionary development, thing, whatever. So it could have been the case, mathematically speaking, it could have been the case that when we measured uh, the, the connectivity uh, uh, patterns of those people, you know, a, a year later, that the entire group was different. Right, that the, the central tendency of the group has shifted along with the individual variations. Mm -hmm. and, and if we saw that, I, I would worry that then we're chasing a moving target. Mm -hmm. And unless we can figure out what was causing that sort of meta-level movement, right, right, the drift, right. the species drift, right. we'd really be in trouble scientifically. So the fact that we have a species typical average that looks stable... Now right, that's the reproducible phenomenon. That, that's a reproducible right. phenomenon, right? right? And, and that tells us that, um, you know, it, it's... Uh, yeah, again, we're, we're not chasing a moving target mm -hmm. in, in that meta-level sense of moving. Right. Right. So that's important. Um, what I, uh, as far as what the alternative is, there's two ways to think about it. Um, one is sort of development of the systems perspective. Mm -hmm. Say, what's really important to understand here is not the resulting architecture per se, right? So, so what's important to measure is not the resulting architect architecture per se. But what's important to, to get a handle on are the uh, developmental mechanisms that give rise to various architectures right. and understand those principles. I mean, it's, it's not a, a dissimilar point that was made earlier, right? right? There are these principles of change. Right. And if you can uh, you know, come up with the, the laws or, or, or however you want to think about it, those principles of change. Right. Um, uh, you know, and you know, in some ways, operant conditioning, right? The laws of operant conditioning, reinforcement learning, and whatnot are, are exemplars for this, right? right. That's a highly consistent, highly reproducible. Right? You'll see the same kind of changes in behavior under different reinforcement regimes. You can mathematically, you can map it out mathematically, you know exactly what to expect. You might be able to do something similar, um, you know, in a developmental systems perspective in terms of these different principles of neural plasticity and neural dynamics. Um, and you might, you know, so for instance, in the neuromodulation, you might uh, imagine projecting, instead of looking at a, at a, at a spatial space, <laughs> sorry, I had to say it that way, Right? Which is what we do now. Right? We look at the brain as a, as a space and we map spatially functions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, not the right way to think about it. Let's instead project into a functional space mm -hmm. right? and see how the brain moves through its various functional configurations. Right? There may be patterns in the way it moves through functional configurations that those patterns themselves will be reproducible even though right, the, the, the functional architecture of any given spot in that functional space is not going to be reproducible either within or between individuals. Which, you know, at least we have saw data just like that. Right. Right. We have the same behavior, uh, and so we have, we have the animal in a particular location in a functional space, 
or the underlying neural architecture that supported that was different at different times. Right? But still, there might be stability in the way in which animals move through a neural configurational space, right, or a neural functional configuration space, projected function or whatever, projected spatially. So those are the kinds of things that I'd like to see happen. Absolutely, and, and so yeah, I definitely would say more longitudinal work is, 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 is needed. Um, I'm, you know, I'm looking, looking forward to, so there's, you probably, some of you probably know, right, there's this population neuroscience project being run out of um, uh, Rotman, the, you know, the other Rotman uh, in Toronto, among other locations, uh, and they're, they are doing, they're, they're scanning thousands of people across the world, and they're going to be doing it, I uh, forget how often, but frequently over their, 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 their lifetimes. Right, uh, uh, they're holding with that data close right now, um, but the plan is to eventually release it, and there's going to be all kinds of fantastic things to find in data like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for a terrific talk, but I want to follow up on that. I'm getting, uh, as it were, uh, cognitive. Uh, Functional roles or mm -hmm. something that evolve. If you, it might be that we want the place to look for this, might be not in the individual brains and even in averaging, but in in patterns uh, in this kind of, uh, well, in, in your thing about the norms that are involved in, a, in, in group efforts and group thing, it might turn out that we. Uh, we can find, uh, in addition, I mean, what, one of the things that struck me, you had a case where there were no, nothing at all relating to individual, individual, almost zero. But if you look at the averages, you found this reproducible pattern. Yep. And of course, we've talked about the quants using this uh, in, in, uh, in uh, finding out that the equations for statistical mechanics could be used to predict stock market behavior and make huge amounts of money. But it would be interesting to see not just that kind of thing, but whether there would be other kinds of patterns that would be more, uh, uh, less account of just averaging that could be picked up and be, but looking not at the individual brains, but at the relations among people and groups and so on. The, um, yeah, the, the closest project I know to, if I understood what you're thinking of, is uh, in this, the, 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 the set of projects that, heard, that are collectively called mind reading or brain reading, right? And this is, uh, people use pattern analysis techniques or machine learning techniques uh, to look at brains in the absence of knowing what the task was that the subject was performing while that picture was generated and try to predict what's going on in that brain. Uh, and the various versions of this, some more and less spectacular. So Jack Gallon's lab at, at Berkeley is doing really fun things by having people watch movies and recording their brain while doing it, and then using the brain to figure out what was actually being seen at the time, and actually reconstruct the visual properties of the movie from the brain uh, scans. And then the question is, okay, so we do that with an individual, how transferable? is that to a different individual? And the answer is somewhat transferable. Not 100%, but somewhat. But you can quantify that, and I think that, that's, yeah, that's really interesting work. Similarly, Carnegie Mellon, uh, is it just, I think, did something similar with, uh, with semantics. So look at semantic features of various uh, words. Um, uh, saw, uh, looked at brain activation while just being shown these words. Didn't use the words themselves, but used the semantic features of the words, right? Related those to patterns of brain activity. And then used um, uh, the semantic features and the patterns that it saw to predict what the brain would look like for novel words, given the semantic features of those novel words. And that works really well, and actually turns out to be somewhat more transferable between individuals uh, than, than the movie stuff is, um, but you know, who knows how good that's going to get eventually. So, so there is interesting work on, on this. Well, for those of us on this side of the room, I think different brain regions are being activated by 
Ah, from the.